Hello and welcome to the swim brief doing something a little bit different this week. One of the reasons for that is I'm going to a swim meet later in the week. So the normal time that uh, Joel and I have to record this podcast, just not available to us. And, um, we didn't really have enough time to prepare, to react to stuff that was happening in the news, but probably what we like to talk about more on this podcast more than anything is the art of coaching, the culture around coaching. And I'm going to do that today. Um, I'm going to actually reference a post I've made on my Instagram, um, which you'll hear me plug at the end of the podcast, uh, but I'll do it here once again, Christy underscore coach on Instagram. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of steps in coaching evolution. And, uh, I have a way that I evaluate myself as a coach, um, both in a macro sense, like, you know, overall, uh, in, in the really big picture, but also in the micro sense in each individual coaching relationship that I have. And, um, I think it's really useful tool. If you're a coach out there who is trying to think about, you know, sort of what stage you are at in this evolution um, and you're going to, no matter how experienced you are or how good you are, um, you're going to find yourself in, depending on the environment, the situation, the context that you're in, or even uh, the piece of what you know that you're trying to share, that this is going to change. So it's a really interesting matrix for looking through that stuff, you know, and I I describe it a bit on Instagram, but like how, how in depth can I get? right? In the course of six pictures that you might scroll through in 60 to 90 seconds or however long our attention spans are on that website. And this podcast gives me the opportunity to talk about things a little bit more in depth, right? To to, to get a layer deeper. And I think a lot of the people that listen to it enjoy getting another layer deeper. So I'm going to take the opportunity to do that. Um, so there's five steps that I have in this hierarchy that I use to evaluate myself as a coach. And like I said, it is useful for me, both in a macro big picture sense and a micro sense. So, um, as I'm going through these, I'm going to talk about some of those micro examples, and I'm also going to talk about some of those examples that are sort of like the history (laughs) of me as I look back on myself as a coach. So what's step one, um, as I see it for people that coach? Well, I think that many of us at the outset of coaching, when we are novice coaching or we are novices in a subject matter that we might be starting to coach. Uh, the first thing that we can get pretty good at is finding flaws, right? So I can remember, um, when I was making that sort of, or sort of my brain was making that transition. Cause I was, I was already transitioning into coach mode, even while I was still an athlete and, uh, you know, as an athlete, you, you take a lot of feedback from coaches. They, they tell you um, sort of what's going on and, and you're, you're very naturally drawn to what you're doing wrong and trying to fix it. Um, and I think that's a totally normal uh, mindset to have, especially as an athlete. And I'm always, even though I know what I'm about to tell you, I'm always surprised by how much athletes have internalized that I've told them that they're doing wrong. Okay. So it's very normal then that when you start to look outwards and think of yourself, maybe as a coach that you can see like, Oh, this person is, is, you know, crossing over their head when they're swimming freestyle and you shouldn't do that, you know, and I'm going to let them know because they probably don't even know they're doing that wrong. And, you may even have some perception like that. This is coaching. You let people know what they're doing wrong because then they figure it out and they can, they can change it. 
And I think it's important to note that for any of these steps, depending on the context of the person on the other end, that, that might actually work. Like I, 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 I think that um, as you get down in the hierarchy, what you're doing is going to be way more likely to work, but it's not that that's, you know, step one here doesn't work. Um, it's just that your chances of it working, I think are way, way less because just letting people know what it is you observe them doing wrong um, in many, many cases doesn't lead to the ultimate outcome that you're trying to get when you're coaching somebody, which is to help them change the way they're doing things for the better, right? I, I think uh, that it can, in fact, oftentimes have a counterproductive driving force because people, as I referenced earlier, can start to tunnel vision on their flaws. They can start to internalize, I'm messing up all the time. They can focus on the fact that they're messing up, as I say in quotes, all the time. And it's not particularly motivating in the long term towards changing something. And if they continue to get that feedback over and over, yeah, you're still messing it up. You're still messing it up. They, they can start to learn a bit of helplessness. Like, well, I've been trying to change, <laughs> but it's not working. So maybe I just can't. Um, all right. So that that's step one, finding flaws. And I think I, I just I just probably painted a negative picture of it. But I, one last important thing I want to say about finding flaws before I move on to step two is it is actually really important to be able to um, find flaws in systems or behaviors because it's very hard to know what you're trying to change without, without that knowledge. So it's not, it's, it's definitely not useless. It's an important part of the process, but in my perception, it is step one. Okay. Step two, right. Charting the path forward. This, um, is where you, as a coach, you take it beyond, Hey, here's what I observe you doing wrong. And you start to give, translate that into some sort of vision for the person that you're coaching. Like, what if we went this path, right? What if, um, what if we changed your behavior in this direction? What if we, um, you're, you're, you're basically, uh, at a broad, broad sense, inviting them to envision a world where their behavior or whatever they're doing is different. And um, instead of just telling them what they're doing wrong, you're painting the picture of a, a world where they are different, right? And so, whereas, that the big distinction here that I see is whereas flaw feedback, flaw-based feedback is always by nature backwards looking. You're always talking about what happened in the past, right? You're telling them, you just did, even if like it's almost instantaneous, you're just telling them, you just did this and I, and I, here's what I saw. The next step, and I think a crucial step in coaching is to offer some sort of forward looking feedback and vision right? So that you're actually painting a picture of what might happen in the future or a direction that things could go in the future. So people know where to go, right? Because again, you don't really want them very focused on what it is they're doing wrong. You want them focused on what they are actually trying to do, not what they're trying not to do, right? It's like the classic example that I use a lot when I travel around to talk to coaches and teams, I go, you know, telling people what their flaws is, is very similar to 
saying to somebody, I want you to try your hardest not to think about a white bear. Right. And uh, even as I said that to you, if this is an audio medium, I bet you're finding it extremely difficult not to think about a white bear. Well, if I tell you you're crossing over in freestyle, you're crossing over in freestyle, you're crossing over in freestyle. Well, guess what your mind's going to be focused on? That you're crossing over in freestyle, right? Um, giving some sort of feedback and saying, you know, um, I think you can learn to swim freestyle better because I've been trying not to bleed into the third category because I do see a distinction between the two of them. Like before you get into the real nitty gritty of the knowledge that you want them to have, you've got to sort of like, you've got to sort of um, prep them to receive that knowledge, right? Like people may take you at face value that something is a, a flaw, but I see as a sort of necessary second step to getting someone to change preparing them for like what is possible, right? Um, in terms of them changing themselves. And then you're gonna tell them how to do it, right? So step three is transmitting knowledge. Um, so many coaches that I know, and if you, if you spend enough time around them and the athletes that they coach, they know so many things that if their athletes knew it, really knew it and, and had, you know, steps four to five in place as well, they would improve so much, right? Like I, the, I think most coaching relationships have a sort of imbalance, which is good. That's the, that's, you know, like your coach should know more about what it is, uh, you can do to improve than you. That's, um, that's to me an important part of the coach is that um, they are, they have a lot of ways forward for you, right? They may be focusing on one and there's a lot of value to focusing on one at a time so that your attention and focus is not divided and, and, you know, trying to accomplish a lot of, different things when it takes, especially at the outset of learning something, when it takes a lot of intentional effort to do it, it takes a lot of, um, executive function, uh, to borrow another term that I've used a lot. When you're, when you're picking up a new habit, you have to be conscious of what you're doing because if you, if you stay in the, um, I'm just going to sort of like, let my brain do what it do its thing, right? It's just going to keep doing what it's always been, what it's got grooved in there. It's going to take the path of least resistance and continue doing the paper. So coming all the way back to coaches have a lot of knowledge. Now I, I made it also a Instagram video that I uploaded. Um, it will have gone up on Tuesday morning, the, the 13th. Um, and there's a really a whole other, sort of more in-depth conversation to be had about this. But um, the gist of that video, which I had to get down to a minute for Instagram, was that coaches are, in my opinion, bilingual. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically about uh, athletic coaches in this context, but I think if you think long, or if I thought long and hard enough about it, I would uh, probably cross it over to any number of other coaching applications. And what I mean by bilingual is remember in the beginning, what they're transmitting in terms of like, for instance, finding flaws or um, maybe even charting a vision might be, or charting a path forward might be what something looks like, because that is the sensory information that, uh, that we draw the most from. As coaches, we watch other people do athletic movements. And um, I'm sure I can, you can probably think of some sports and actually I don't want to totally discount this in the, in the case of swimming where yes, what you hear might be important, 
right? But, but I would argue that the vast majority of sensory information that we are trying to translate into a form for athletes to use is visual. It's what we see. Now, the reason I say bilingual and, 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 and reference translating is if you just tell an athlete what you see, that's, that's like, it is like speaking a different language because the sensory, they don't see themselves. They are not able to see themselves. You are giving them sensory information that is not particularly useful. Now you can get, let them see themselves, right? I feeling the iPad crowd here. Um, <laughs> and I I'm, I'm in the iPad crowd. Like I show people themselves. And, um, I think one of the reasons why, uh, probably that works so well is because it is athletes will very naturally translate that themselves. And many athletes can translate your visual like feedback into they, they can translate it without you having to. Don't get me wrong. Like I said at the beginning, athletes can just like flip the switch at any step of this. And anybody who's had experience, I guess this is another interjection I want to put in here because I've coached some pretty high level athletes over the years. One of the things that lulls you or can, that can, can lull you into some complacency with coaching really high level athletes is many of them will make lasting changes without you having to get down this step of evolution whatsoever. Like you can just tell them what they're doing wrong and they'll fix it. And it's amazing, right? I, I, there's got to be some people listening to this who know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And you just, and then you want to, you know, on some level, you, you, you can go on to other athletes you're coaching and go like, well, why, you know, it must be something wrong with you because I coached this other person and I just told them what they were doing wrong and they fixed it the first time I told them, right? Instead of thinking like, maybe it has to do more with me as a coach and the fact that I haven't really like gotten to the highest level that I can get to. So or at this stage of transmitting knowledge. And really to me, I think the athlete is sensorily like they are feeling their way through it. I know so many swim coaches and I'm one of them who get driven crazy by coaching at a swim meet. You, you talk to an athlete right after the race and go, well, that didn't feel good. And you go, it doesn't matter. You know, like you want to scream as loud as you possibly can. It doesn't matter how you feel, right? Because we all know intrinsically that you can feel terrible and swim really well, or you can feel great and not swim well. Like that, that, that those, there's really not a strong causal relationship between those two things. But I always have to remind myself that is the information that the athletes have to bring back to us. Like that is what they experienced. So they're just telling you, um, when I'm, they're not sitting back, like you are analytically you know, from 30 feet away, watching themselves swim. They are in there, um, you know, thrashing through the water. And the sensory experience of that is the, is, is the, really the information that they have to draw on for that relationship. And by the way, there's a whole nother conversation to be had about those post-race conversations that I will eventually get to on a podcast. So if you want to be even more effective in your coaching, I would suggest that you, you have to figure out a way to translate what it is you see into sensory information that an athlete might be able to go, oh, okay, that's what it feels like to change this thing. Right. I'll give it like a great basic example from the sport of swimming is there are so, so many swimmers that have no idea. I've coached too many of them where their hands are entering the water 
when after recovery on backstroke. So they got their arm above their head and so, 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 so many of them, right, enter, cross over their body, they throw themselves completely out of alignment and they think that they're just putting their arm straight from their shoulder in the water. That's what they feel, right? So we, we might say something like, uh, you know, like enter at 10 and two on a clock, if any of them have actually still seen an analog clock live in the world and know how to tell time, right? But but essentially what the basic example is there, you're, you're telling them that actually, even though their brain is going, I'm, I'm putting my arm in straight, they're not, that's what you see. And therefore putting their arm in where you want them to on this clean line from the shoulders, so everything's connected through to the body is going to feel like they are way out wide sort of laterally from themselves, right? Okay, so that's an example of transmitting, translating knowledge. Now, if you've done all three, right? You, if you've accomplished all three with them, right? Maybe it works. Um, maybe still, in my opinion, somebody that you coach might need help motivating towards action. I think we can all think about examples in our lives where we know exactly what it is we should do to improve. Somebody has impressed that upon us, or we have, you know, sought that knowledge out. We have learned it. We know we've maybe even tried it to the extent that we like know we we're really like 100% we know what to do. We know what it is to do, but we're not doing it. We are struggling at the stage of motivating ourselves to do it. Now, this is a fascinating stage because um, as I get into stage five, I will talk about like sort of a real potential pitfall of this because I, I, I see, I've seen in my own career and then I've seen in the observations of coaches I talk to and, and I talk to so many coaches <laughs> per week and I can't help but talk about this kind of stuff. This, um, that are that these coaches that are amazing motivators. They're amazing at motivating people and getting them to do something differently. And that's a really important skill, right? So people may, like I said, people may know exactly what it is you want them to do. They may know, they may have translated it in a way where they like, they really know it. And yet it is exceedingly hard for them to just do it, do it. And because at least partially because of what I referenced earlier, because doing something new always, especially at the outset takes a lot of conscious thought and effort. And that is limited within the human brain. We only have so much attention and focus that we can give. So, um, and many of us, myself included have, um, some funky wiring in terms of how well we can direct ourselves towards changing something that we're about to do. So it can be really useful to have somebody, a coach on the other end who can apply, uh, like a stimulus to us that will just like, really just like motivate you there. Now, I think, um, again, there's a whole nother conversation to be had about this. I, I and, um, and, uh, I, 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 I'm not going to get into it here. I mean, fear is incredibly motivating. I think that's one of the reasons why we have some, uh, really tough habits <laughs> in the sport, uh, in the sporting world, because, um, in a, in a less enlightened era, we, we, you know, have applied plenty of fear to motivate people to do things. I, I do, th I don't, um, particularly believe in that. Right. I think, um, because there's a sort of a corrosive effect of that over time of keeping people 
in these sort of endemic fear states. And, and it's just not very kind or good <laughs> um, on a basic human level. Um, so, you know, uh, this is also a, a stage where you may find yourself drawing back on step two on that sort of positive path forward and uh, continuing to sort of get the person in the headspace of envisioning what is next and, you know, like looking at that target, right? So that, and, and you be the person that keeps r r like putting it back at the front of their frame of whatever they're looking through. Do you just keep, you know, you keep saying the words that get them to go, okay, yes, yeah, sorry, no, that this is what I, I, I decided I wanted to do this and I'm trying to do this. And I believe that this is leading to this outcome. Now, as I said, there is a big potential pitfall here and I see it quite a bit in coaching and I've fallen into it more times than I want to admit is you can be good, so good at motivating change for people that they, um, that they don't really make it to step five which is, I, I always reference, I almost wanted to title the slide for it, the learning how to fish stage, right? So um, I, I said, I almost titled it because I said, you're gonna put this fish analogy in there and like you haven't developed it at all. And people are reading this in 60 seconds and they're gonna go, what is he talking about, right? <laughs> Acknowledge that most people's brain don't really um, make connections in the same way that you do, especially since you're inside. Um, but I'll make it here. I think, you know, like step four as a coach is really to me, like feeding, feeding people that are hungry. You're, 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 you're making them a meal, but you're not teaching them how to feed themselves. I think in most cases you are, you are nourishing them with motivation. You are, you are providing this external source of motivation and that is good. And that is like amazing. And that is what makes so many coaches amazing, but even better is if you're simultaneously teaching them how to motivate change within themselves. Because what that allows is, for instance, that you go back to some earlier steps, you can have them devoting attention and focus to self-improvement, basically self-improvement projects, and you get more of your attention to be forward looking as a coach. You can lay out more track essentially in front of them. This becomes really important the better athlete and by better athlete, I mean, sort of more improving athlete that you have, because it is a challenge. Like if I reference to, you know, some of these, these, um, really, really high level athletes I've coached where you, you can get to step one and they will change something. Well, like you need to be ready for what's next because they, um, they are in most cases actually pretty demanding in a good way. They want to, they like, they, they're like, okay, what's next? I, I want to keep getting better, right? What are we, what are we doing now? And unless you have as yourself, like, cause we, again, we all have limited attention and focus unless you have some attention remaining to be that forward looking, to be uh, planning globally for them, then you're, you're not going to be fully prepared, um, in, in your best way to give them that next 
step. And as I said, I think the examples uh, I, at the outset, I said I was going to you know, talk about macro and micro. And I think I gave a lot of micro examples on, on a macro um, level. I would say, you know, I, I think I use this to evaluate all sorts of different like sort of subject areas or even even within subject areas evaluate myself because some stuff I've been teaching it for so long, I have a lot easier time getting to step five because I'm so comfortable through the first few steps. Right. It's so natural, like I would do it without even thinking about it. Right. I, 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 um, I sort of intervene and I, um, chart, chart that path forward. I like, I, I, I know exactly what to say that it, it makes sense to them pretty quickly. And, and then other subject areas, I can see that I either don't have enough reps teaching it, or I don't know it well enough probably some combination of both that it's very hard for me to get beyond step one. And to me, that just like in evaluating myself, that's just a way of knowing, okay, I got to keep work. Got to keep working on this because I know that if, if I work on it for long enough and hard enough, it'll get easier to get through the first few steps. And that's going to make me more effective for the people that I'm coaching. So that was like a half hour deep dive on a tool that I use to evaluate myself. And I use this also um, when I'm coaching other people um, in, in, in when I'm coaching coaches, um, which is something I'm really passionate about. I hope that you enjoyed listening to it. I hope you go check out my Instagram, Christy underscore coach. Um, you can find the same content for the time being. Also on Facebook, Chris DeSantis Coaching. On Facebook, it's wildly more popular than my Instagram for whatever reason, probably because it's got a lot of um, uh, more followers from over the years. Um, I had a presence there for a long time. This will be uploaded to um, the uh, Christopher DeSantis YouTube channel. This will be uploaded as a uh, podcast on the Swim Brief you can find on iTunes and Spotify. I hope you guys all have a great week. Um, comment below, talk about how you evaluate yourselves. Um, if you're coaching, how do you, you know, how do you sort of structurally break down the steps of teaching somebody something that, you know, that they're going to change in themselves. I find this stuff endlessly interesting as you can tell. So I'd love to hear from you. Um, and otherwise, uh, Joel and I should be back with another podcast for you before Christmas hits. Um, so thanks for listening and I'll see you then.